A good Wednesday evening to you. This is Pastor Jones here at Valley Assembly of God, Hagerstown, Maryland, welcoming you to our midweek Bible study. Uh, we're excited right now because everything is getting ready to gear back up as we enter the fall. And uh, tonight we're going to do a study here that's kind of going to dovetail between the lengthy study we had been on and the Christian worker and the new study that is going to pose a, a number of questions and then turn around and, and answer those questions relative to your individual life and to the things that you face every day as a believer and as an individual. Let me just remind you that uh, we are getting ready to start back up. We're going to have Sunday school at 9 o'clock. Uh, 10 o'clock is our morning worship. On the 12th of September, we will be back to our Sunday night at 6 o'clock. Royal Rangers, Girls Ministries will be going on. And then, of course, uh, Wednesday night will start on the 15th. That's 7 o'clock with our youth group uh, meeting and children's ministries and our in-depth Bible study going on right here in the sanctuary. Like always, we're doing our best to keep everybody safe, encouraging people to stay socially distanced and do not be shaking hands. Uh, we want to make sure everybody's healthy, everybody's safe, and we would certainly extend an invitation to you, and we certainly are hoping to see you soon. I'm in Acts, this first chapter tonight, and <clears throat> the eighth verse of Scripture. Jesus said, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye should be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. I want to talk to you for a few minutes tonight about every one of us being witnesses, witnesses unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray before we get into it, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that's open before us. May it challenge us, may it stir us tonight. And God, I pray, help your church get to its feet and to be the witness that you have called us to be, a witness that can only be effective once we are anointed from on high by the Holy Spirit. Father, may that same anointing we're talking about tonight be upon this preacher and upon your word. And Lord, we'd be so careful to give you the praise and thanks for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read a paragraph to you that puts what I want to talk to you about tonight in a nutshell as it lays the groundwork for what I want to say. For a period of 40 days, between the first fruits and Pentecost, the risen Lord tarried here on the earth. Over yonder the standards of the Almighty were unfurled. To the utmost bounds of the everlasting hills, the heralds had borne the news. The Lord is risen indeed. The morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Twelve legions of angels were drawn up in battle array along the jasper battlements of heaven and at the gates of pearl. Eager eyes were watching both but still he did not come. Still he tarried. Even though his own heart was hungry to go home, he stayed because he had one more thing to do. And that's what we want to talk about tonight. He needed to prepare the disciples for the task that he had in mind. And my friends, that task that was laid upon them is still laid upon you and I, the church. And we need to once again grasp it, understand it, stand tall, and begin to make a difference in this day and hour in which we live. First thing, they needed enlistment. So he made his passion known to them. He wanted them to reach the uttermost part of the earth. They were to witness to him, for him, in Jerusalem in Judea, in Samaria, and to earth's remote bounds. They were to meet a man from Ethiopia and a man from Macedonia. They were to meet men and women, boys and girls, from all parts of the world. 
It was to be the whole duty. Listen now. It was to be the whole duty of the whole church for the whole age. And that has not changed. It's still laid upon you and I, the church, to reach this lost world, to impact it for the Lord Jesus Christ. That was Jesus' passion. And that is what needs to be our passion as well. The whole world must know the good news that Christ died for their sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again. You know what it boils down to as we are witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ? It, it boils down to the task at hand that it started then and is still going today is that we must reach lost souls for Christ. Sinners must be saved. They must be born again. That's the urgency of this moment. It always has been. Moreover, they needed encouragement. So he made his presence known to them. He himself would always be with them. And to the end of the world, he would be with them. So he showed himself alive after his passion by many, the Bible says in Acts 1, 3, infallible proofs, undeniable proofs. The task was thus simplified. They were not called to preach a dogma or a creed or found some new religion, and, and we're not to do that either. We're not here just preaching a certain a doctrine and, and, and running into the ground and breaking it off. We're here to lift up Jesus. We're here to introduce Jesus to a lost and dying world. My friends, they were called to preach Christ, to tell people of a living, relevant person. They were to make him real to other people. However, before they could make him real to anyone else, he had to be real to them. And that's the cunning edge, isn't it? I know I grew up in church. I went through two years of catechism, became an acolyte in the church I attended. But I never knew Christ. He wasn't alive to me. Yes, the Bible was in front of me. And yes, we went through the motions of religion. But my friends, if Jesus is not real to you, it will be impossible for you to make him real to somebody else. The same was true of the disciples. He had to be real to them before they could present him to be real to other people. That has not changed. So the Lord prepared, appeared here and showed up there. He made himself real to this one and then to that one. They needed to become convinced of his abiding presence, that he was there alongside of them, whether seen or unseen. Do you, do you have that evidence this evening? You know that everywhere you go, the Lord's with you, standing at your side, enabling and strengthening you to do what he has called you to do. My friends, we need to be convinced of that. We don't have to fall to our knees every time we pray. We can go down the road and carry on a, on a conversation with God. And we need to have our ears sensitized and our hearts open that we might hear that still small voice as he guides and directs our steps. He was there as he promised he would be to the end of time, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. He appeared to each in a different way. With Mary, it was the whisper of her name. That's what clued her in. That's what let her know this was Jesus. This wasn't the gardener. It was Jesus. With the disciples on the road to Emmaus, it was his unfolding or enlightening the word of God as he walked in the way. And Jesus spoke truth into them. It opened their eyes, especially as they sat by the campfire. And he broke bread and then Jesus disappeared. They said, did our hearts not burn within us as he broke the bread of life with us? Friends, when the word of God is preached, our hearts need to burn within us. Excitement, the thrill, the elation the truth of God's word that comes alive to us. 
And then with Thomas, it was his hands and his feet and his side. By the time he was through, they all were convinced of the reality of his resurrection, his rapture, and his return. Listen, we've got to be convinced of that or we'll never convince anybody else. We must be solidly established in the Lord Jesus Christ and know him personally if we are to impact those about us and touch them for the Lord Jesus Christ. Then, too, these folks needed enlightenment. So he made his program known to them. They were to begin in their own community, Jerusalem. That is where it begins for all of us. When I got saved, I went home and I told my mom and dad and sister, I got saved. They didn't understand what I was talking about. But I immediately wanted to witness to them. And I used every opportunity to interject Christ in their heart and life. Put records on, played gospel music, uh, did all kinds of things. My friends, I began to witness to them. One I witnessed to, rejected my witness, went on his way, living in the world and died in a horrible car accident. Another one I witnessed to on a Saturday night, came to church the next morning, gave his heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ and went on to be a minister of the gospel, just recently retired. Listen, you start where you're at. You start where you're living. They were to start in Jerusalem. They were to reach their own providence, Judea. They were to evangelize their own continent, beginning with Samaria, the closest alien culture to them. They were to reach the whole world wide for Christ. That, my friends, was the plan. It is not changed. We live in a world of eight plus billion people, and it's God's initiative that through us as believers, the church, the, the missionary, the evangelist, that we are to reach the four corners of this earth and touch people for Christ. The book of Acts shows us how closely and how successfully that plan was followed. My friends, the same program is the program of God's church tonight. May God help us to see it. You see, the church is not called here to entertain people. Flashing lights, smoke and whistles, bells and whistles. We're here to gather at the church, be energized by the word and by the Holy Spirit, and then go out into the highways and byways of everyday life and to touch lives for Christ. That's what Jesus was trying to get across to them. And then finally... They needed enablement. You see, they were probably just like you and I when we look at this program of God's. We, we stand back and say, how, how can I do this? How am I capable of, of this enormous task that, that lies before us? They needed enablement, so he made his power known to them. He set before them the impossible task of persuading people to repent of their sins and to turn to Christ and to accept him by faith and have their lives transformed. That, that program hasn't changed in the least bit. We are here endeavoring to convince men of their sins, their need of Christ, their need to repent, and their need to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But the problem was that they were powerless to witness. I wonder how many sit in church pews across the country and the world that are powerless to make an impact on those round about them. And primarily the problem lies in the fact that in of ourselves, we don't have the power. We don't have the ability. We need God-given power, God-given enablement. When Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of Christ, and the other women told the twelve that Jesus was alive, Luke 24, 11, the Bible says, their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed him not. 
You see, you can witness, you can talk to people about the Lord, but if the anointing, the enablement of the Holy Spirit is not there, it won't make any impact. Just like it didn't on these disciples when these women uh, told them that Jesus had risen from the dead. When the disciples on the road to Emmaus arrived back in Jerusalem with the news of a risen Christ, Mark 16 and 13 says, neither believed they them. Even though they were so convinced, even though their hearts burned within them, for them to convey this truth to the others, it impacted them not at all. They needed the power of God's Holy Spirit to make that witness impact their lives. When all 10 of the other disciples tried to convince Thomas, this is what Thomas said, I will not believe. In every case, they needed divine enablement. Jesus said, Acts 1.8, I go back to the text we started with. Ye shall receive power. When? After the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I'm frankly weary of preachers that try to downplay the Holy Spirit. Try to say that the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues is of the devil. It's not of God. It's the flesh. I, I've heard it all over the years. But here's the bottom line. Without that divine Holy Ghost enablement, we are never going to impact this world for Christ like we need to. Boy, we need this enablement today. They not only needed it, we need it. For it's only the Holy Spirit who can make Christ real. That's what it's all about. Make him real to the unregenerate and disbelieving heart. Otherwise, we're merely wasting our breath. And that's exactly what he did on the day of Pentecost. And with such phenomenal success on the day of Pentecost, thousands were swept into the kingdom of heaven that same day. Fast forward to the 21st century. Churches are closing by the hundreds and thousands every year. Our own ability to impact our society has been greatly diminished in recent months and years. My friends, it is time for an old-fashioned Holy Ghost enablement to, be, to come upon God's church, upon you and I as individuals, so we can really reach this world for the Lord Jesus Christ. We need this enablement. We need it today. We're enlisted. He's with us. We know his plan. But now we need the divine enablement to set that plan into motion, to impact hearts and lives, and to really make a difference. May God put within your heart, all of our hearts, a desire, a hunger, a thirst for this precious Holy Ghost power and his presence in our life so we can be used of God to impact others and to really, really make a difference. Bow your heads with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for this time in your word. We thank you for this important message, this important study. And I pray, God, that you would cause us to hunger and thirst and to tarry and wait and not be satisfied until we are endued with power from on high. And then having been endued, God, may we not play with the Holy Spirit like he is a, uh, a toy, but God, understand that the precious Holy Spirit comes and fills our life to endue us with power that we might be mighty witnesses for you. God, may we be that mighty witness as we enter the fall of the year. May we be used of you to bring individuals and new families, God, through the doors of the church and to a saving knowledge in Jesus Christ. God, I pray that these days ahead are going to be unprecedented days as we see the power of God work in our midst as we just open our hearts and lives to you and let go and let God have his way. Now, Father, I pray, prepare us for the Sunday that's coming. 
I pray, Lord, anoint everything we lay our hands to and use us, I pray, oh God, to make a difference. We thank you for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm ready to go out and witness for the Lord. Are you? Let's make a difference this week. I'm going to look for you Sunday. Have a great week in God. Stay safe. And may you seek God with everything you got and not be satisfied until you are due with power. God bless.